Let me ask you a completely ridiculous question, uh, but it's a fascinating one for me from an engineering and a scientific perspective. When I look at a sport, really any problem, one way to ask how difficult is this problem is to see how can I build a machine that competes with a human being at that problem. You can look at chess, mm. you can look at soccer, RoboCup, uh, and then you can look at grappling. There's something about when you start to think, how would I build an AI system, a robot that defeats somebody like a Gordon Ryan, where it forces you to really think about formalizing this art Mm. as a as an engineering discipline in the same way you do but you 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 still have some art injected in there there is no space for art when you actually have to build the system that's not a ridiculous question that's a damned interesting question let's put aside uh, like like i mentioned with the boston dynamic spot robots what people don't realize is the amount of power they can deliver is huge so let's take that weapon aside just the amount of force you're able to deliver. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you're specifying that. Um, uh, so essentially your question is, okay, can can a talented group of engineers create a robot which could defeat Gordon Ryan? On, on, yes. on the face of it, um, as you just pointed out, that's the easiest project in the world. Just create a <laughs> robot that carries a nine millimeter automatic and shoot yes. him five times yes. in the chest. Okay, yes. that's it, Gordon Ryan's done. Um, so that's not the interesting question. The interesting question, and I, if I understand you correctly, is if we had the ability to create a robot whose physical powers were identical to yeah. Gordon Ryan, not inferior and not superior, what would it take to create a mind inside that robot that would beat Gordon Ryan in the majority of matches? Yeah, and there's two ways to build AI systems. This is true for autonomous driving, for example, uh, which has been quite contested uh, recently. So one is you basically, one way to describe it is you have a giant set of rules. It's like this tree of rules where you apply in different condition. When there's a pattern you see, you apply a rule and they're hard coded in. Mm. You basically get like a John Donahue type of character who tries to encode, hard code into the system, all the moves you should do in every single case. Of course, you can't actually do that fully, so you're going to be taking shortcuts, uh, what are called heuristics, just a basic, basic kind of generalizations, mm -hmm. to, and apply your own expertise as an expert of, uh, in this case, grappling, to see how that can be encoded as a rule. Now, the other approach, uh, Elon Musk and Tesla are taking this approach, which is called machine learning, mm -hmm. which yeah, is. <laughs> create a basic framework of the kind of things you should be observing and what are the measures, metrics of success, and then just observe and see which things lead to success, more mm -hmm. success, and which lead to less success. And there's a delta. You Like when you, when you see a thing, first of all, the way machine learning works is you predict, you see a position or you see a situation, and then you predict how good that is and then you watch how it actually turns out. And if it's uh, worse or better, you adjust your expectations. Yes, that's and through that yeah. process, you can learn quite a lot. The, the challenge is, and this might be a very true challenge in grappling, is uh, in, like, in driving, you can't crash. <laughs> so there's a physical world. In chess, for example, where this uh, approach has been exceptionally successful. You can work in simulation. So you can have a um, AI system that, for example, with uh, as in the case with Alpha Zero by DeepMind, Google's DeepMind, it can play itself in simulation millions of times, billions of times. Correct, yeah. It's difficult to know if it's possible to do that in simulation for, for, for anything that involves human movement, like uh, grappling. So that's my sense is if we f first look at the hard co encoding, if you were to try to describe Gordon Ryan to a machine, how many rules are in there, do yeah. you think? Yeah. Um, first off, let me tell you, that's one of the most fascinating questions I've ever been asked. And uh, I'm 
tr- tremendously happy to, to answer this. Um, how about what we do is this is a this is a massive question you've asked. There's a huge amount of ways this could get very interesting and very confusing. Let's set some ground rules for, for the discussion. Um, uh, Lex alluded to the idea of man versus machine and chess. Okay, and I think that's a really good place for us to start the the discussion. Um, I'm going to. Uh, just tell people about a little bit the history of man versus chess to give you guys some uh, some background on this. In 1968, there was a, a party in which a highly ranked, not not a world champion, but a highly ranked chess player, and his name was Levy, and he met a uh, a computer engineer uh, at a party, and they had a a uh, a lighthearted bet that in a 10 year time frame a human chess player would be defeated by a computer. Now, you got to remember, 1968, computing power was very, very low. The computers that got America to the moon were were actually pretty damn primitive. Your iPhone would kick all of their asses. Um, so computational power was very, very low in those days. So interestingly, the chess player fully believed that no computer could beat him in the 10-year time frame, and the uh, the computer engineer was very optimistic that he was wrong, and that in fact, ten years, uh, the computer would win. Ten years later, they had a competition, and the human won, uh, decisively. In fact, so uh, computational power simply hadn't risen to that level yet. Through the 1980s, computational power increased, but not sufficient to uh, to to get to championship level. Uh, there were computer programs in the 1980s which were competitive with good, solid chess players, but not world beaters. Um, understand right from the start that there's a fundamental problem here. The number of options that the two players in a chessboard can run through is astronomically high. There are 64 squares on a chessboard. The number of possible options that can could work or uh, could play out on a chessboard, and this is a truly shocking thing for you to think about, the number of possible options is higher than the number of atoms in the known universe. <laughs> think about that for a second in terms of complexity, okay? The number of atoms on this table is massive, okay? <laughs> that is an unbelievably large number. Then we're talking about a situation where if a computer had to go through all the options at the onset of a match, they would have to run numbers greater than the number of atoms in the known universe. The number of galaxies and the number of uh, in our universe is vast, okay? It's measured in the billions. Like the number of atoms, that's just the a number so mind-blowing it's impossible, okay? So no computer is ever going to be able to work with those kinds of numbers, okay? you that I don't even know if future generations of quantum computers could could work it with those kinds of numbers. So that's the fundamental problem, okay? The, the number of options in a, in a chess match is just so astronomically large that no computer could ever figure out all the, the available options and make decisions in a given time frame. So that's the fundamental problem. So as Lex correctly pointed out, the way you get around this is by the use of heuristics. These are rules of thumb, uh, which give general guidelines to action. So for example, in jiu-jitsu, I could give you a general rule of thumb. Uh, don't turn your back on your opponent. Okay, that's a solid piece of advice. There are obviously some exceptions to that rule, but it's a good, solid piece of advice to give a beginner. The moment you give that heuristic rule, you rule out a lot of options. Okay, you've already told someone, don't turn your back. Don't turn your back on someone. So a lot of possibilities have just been turned away right there. So you've cut the number of options in half right there just by giving one heuristic rule. Okay, if you were decent at chess, not great, but decent, and you knew enough to give, say, 10 heuristic rules, you could chop that initially vast number of options down by a vast amount. And now you're starting to get to a point where if a computer had sufficient computational power, it could start getting through the number of options 
in that acceptable time frame. So that's the general pattern of the development. Now, things started getting very interesting in the mid-1990s with IBM's computer Deep Blue. Uh, there was a, a great chess champion of the late 1980s and early 19, uh, through the 1990s called uh, Gary Kasparov, who had been more or less undefeated for a decade. In 1996, he took on IBM's computer Deep Blue. Just to correct the record, he was undefeated. <laughs> I apologize, Russian. Got, got to make sure they, they get very nationalistic about their chess. Be careful of these guys. <laughs> Deep Blue lost the first confrontation, I believe, in 1996. It was competitive, but it lost. Then in 1997, uh, Deep Blue won, and it, it wasn't a complete walkover. Kasparov, I believe, won one of the matches, but uh, they did unequivoc uh, Deep Blue unequivocally won the confrontation, and it was seen as like this watershed moment where. A computer beat the best human chess player on the planet, and that was it. There was, there's no coming back from that. I think it would be remembered as one of uh, the biggest moments in computing history. Is is really when the first time a machine beat a human at a thing that humans really care about in the in the domain of intellectual pursuits. Yeah, no, it was a, it was a it was a powerful powerful moment. Now, not only was that a powerful moment, but things started getting truly interesting from that moment forward. Because then you started having different areas of development. Um, the general way in which the progress is made from those early starts in 1968 all the way through to Deep Blue's victory was of the use of heuristic rules that brought down the number of potential options to a manageable level as computer power increased then it could make faster and faster and wiser and wiser decisions and make them at a rate which no human, even the best human, could keep up with. So that was the general way in which the the, the debate went. Um, but things got more interesting after this with the advent of computers that, as you pointed out, make use of so-called machine learning. There were uh, a, a company put out uh, a program, Alpha Zero, which can look at the basic rule structures of chess and then ultimately play itself in trial games and make trial and error assessment of what are good and bad strategies so that with no human intervention, a computer could start doing remarkable things. Not only did uh, this company create Alpha Zero, and there were, there were some other ones too, that they fought not only in chess, but in the much more complex Asian game of Go, which has far more potential options yeah. than chess does by a very significant margin. Yes. These machine learning programs not only easily defeat any human in chess, but in Go as well. And what's truly remarkable is they weren't just beating them. When Alpha Zero took on a rival chess program, which by itself was already superior to any human, it only required four hours, starting from learning the rules of chess to figuring out how to beat the second most powerful chess program in the world. That's insane. That's literally like taking a human, telling them the rules of chess, they play some games with themselves, for four hours, and they go out and beat Gary Kasparov. <laughs> this is, I, to me, this is a, a truly exciting development, far beyond even what Deep Blue did. I like how you said exciting, not terrifying. Yeah. Because I agree with you on the exciting. Yeah. Now, things also get exciting in a different direction. There is another possibility which few people foresaw after the Deep Blue episode. This is where a new form of chess started to emerge, sometimes called cyborg chess or centaur chess, where humans of moderate chess level playing ability, not world champions, just decent but not great, uh, I guess you might say like purple belts in jiu-jitsu, mm -hmm. allied themselves with computers. So the humans and computers worked as a cyborg team. The humans supplied the heuristic insight, 
the computers supplied the computational power. And fascinatingly, they proved to be superior to both the best humans and the best chess programs. The united force of human insight with heuristics, with computers' ability to go through uh, numbers in, in far more rapid form than any human could ever hope to do, proved to be one of the strongest combinations and enabled that pairing of human and computer to overwhelm both the best single human and the best single computer. That adds a whole new level of fascination to this topic. So to, to wind things up here, we've got this fascinating initial question from Lex, the idea of could there be a computer inside a robot which doesn't have any special physical properties. This is mind versus mind because the bodies negate each other. The robot is the same body as Gordon Ryan. This is a thought experiment. What would it take to create a mind that would defeat the mind of Gordon Ryan? Based on the chess example, it would appear that this is entirely feasible at some point in the future. And in fact, I would go further and say it's actually quite likely based on what we've seen from the example of chess. The rate of progress in AI in the last 20 years is well, has dwarfed anything from the previous 50 years. And the rate continues to increase. We're talking now at a level where with machine learning defeating world champions in chess and go in four hours, like just from starting from the rules of the sport. Um, this is this is going to be difficult for humans to keep up with. Now, in humans' favor, could we take Gordon Ryan and put a chip inside his brain that created the same cyborg effect as we saw in Centaur Chess and Cyborg Chess, and then take Gordon Ryan to a new level where suddenly his computational powers were massively increased? He still has his heuristic insight, but he has vastly augmented computational powers. That's the interesting battle. Mm -hmm. I, uh, you asked a great question, Lex. Let me give you my, my initial push for an answer would be that if it's just Gordon Ryan versus your, your, uh, your robot technology in 10 years, I would say with machine learning, I, I say you guys win every time. But if it is cyborg Gordon <laughs> Ryan, where he's part, part Gordon Ryan with heuristics and part machine, then that's, and now that's where I throw the question back at you, young man. What do you think? Well, I'm fascinated to hear your answer. That's very interesting because because there's, uh, there's a lot of different ways you can build a, a cyborg Gordon Ryan. So one is there's the Neuralink way, which is basically say doing what you're suggesting, which is expanding the computational capabilities of Gordon Ryan's brain. Hmm like directly being able to communicate between a computer and the, and the brain. So most of, you preserve uh, most of what there is in the human body, including the nervous system and the, the computing system we currently have that's biological and expanding it with the computer. There's also on the cyborg chess front, the like Magnus Carlsen, the current world champion yes. in chess, he studies alpha zero games like that it's not a regular thing for high level grandmasters uh, from what i understand almost every uh, chess master now studies computer games for for inspiration like that uh just as um uh great chess players from the past used to go back into old leather bound books of previous grandmasters and study games and books nowadays most people when they want to study the most perfect games they actually study programs like Alpha Zero. Yeah, and it's not just for inspiration, it's education. It's, I mean, it's literally part of their training regimen. Yeah. This isn't like a fun side thing. This is the main way to get better. So, um, so there's a certain element there where even our human brains can be trained by observing the partial explorations of an AI systems in the space of grappling. Uh, that could be actually in simulation. It doesn't have to be in the physical world. It could be uh, in 
if we construct sufficiently good biomechanical models of human beings, machines can learn how they grapple. There's there's quite a bit of uh, that already. OpenAI has the system of, uh, they have like sumo wrestlers with some basic goals of pushing each other off of a platform. And you know nothing from the, you don't even know, so you have a basic model of a bipedal system. It doesn't even know in the beginning how to stand up. It just falls, right? So it has to learn how to get up and they do that through self-play. They they learn how to get up, they learn how to move enough to achieve the final goal, which is to push your opponent off of the thing. Fascinating. So they learn that. Now, OpenAI is not, those folks are currently not that interested in the grappling world, so they kind of, of stop course. there. Yeah. But it's very possible in simulation to then develop ideas. In fact, this is something I should probably do, because it's pretty natural to do and easy, is ideas of control and submission and all all the, you know, you add the ability to, I don't know how to put it nicely, but to, uh, to choke your opponent uh, and uh, to break their body parts off, which is what Jiu Jitsu is, add that in and what kind of ideas they'll come up with is very fascinating. I actually don't know until this conversation, I don't know why I never even thought about that. I've been very obsessed with just like walking and, and running and all those kinds of things, like evolving different strategies for when you have a bunch of, so one difficult thing for robots is when you have uneven terrain and there's uncertainty about the terrain is how to keep walking or when when there's a bunch of things being thrown at you, all that kind of stuff. And you learn uh, through self-play how to be able to navigate those uncertain environments when there's a lot of weird objects and all those kinds of things. There's no reason why you can't just do that with uh, with submissions and so on in simulation. That'll be actually fascinating. But once we might be surprised by the kind of strategies in simulation these AI systems will develop, and that might make a much better Gordon Ryan and much better John Donahar in wait in asking the Dean Lister question of like why are we only using why are we do, not doing X, but on the actual sort of grappling event in the physical space, I've been very surprised and a little bit disappointed by how difficult it's to build a system that's able to have the body of Gordon Ryan or a human being actually, which means it's not just the, the biomechanics, which is very difficult to do, but also all of the senses that are involved be able to perceive the world as richly, to be able to, uh, there's something called soft robotics, which is, is incredibly difficult to do through touch, understand the hardness of things. We don't understand as human beings, just how much we're able through touch to experience the world and to manipulate the world. Like the, the, the process of picking up a cup is very similar to the process of grappling. All the feeling you, that you do, all the leverage that you're applying, there is so many degrees of freedom in both the, in the interactive sense, in the sensing and the applying, sensing and applying. You're doing that through so much of your body mm. that it's just going to be very difficult to build a system that's able to experience the world and act onto the world as richly as we humans can. Yeah, if, um, if picking up a cup is a seemingly insurmountable challenge than then taking someone down, controlling them, getting past their legs. That's gonna be one hell of a project. Exactly. I mean there could be shortcuts, but I mean currently that's um that's that's the field called uh, robotic manipulation, which is picking up objects. Usually they have like a ball and a triangular object and your whole task is to like pick it up and move it around. Generalizing that to the human body is harder, but perhaps not so so not as hard as we might think. The question is, how do you construct experiments where you can do that safely? In chess, that's very easy. Yeah. But here, that's very very problematic. Um, it's, I, it's, it's I guess a, you could just have robot versus robot teamed up with each other and then they learn and then they go out to take on a human opponent. Yes, exactly. So you have two physical robots that uh, interact with each other. Everything you've said so far suggests that 
many of the problems, these tactile elements, they're, they're easy tasks for humans. So which becomes more powerful more quickly? Robots that are taught to think like humans or humans that are given the computational power of, uh, of, of computers and robots themselves. Which wins first, a cyborg Gordon Ryan or an artificial robot Gordon Ryan? Really, really strong question. And I think, I think by far the cyborg Gordon Ryan. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking here. The yeah. problems you're talking about uh, with regards to the robots, those are those are deep problems. Like if, if, if picking up a cup is problematic, it's going to be damn difficult to. But to a human, that's a you know a two year old can do that. You're high, highlighting a very important difference: is human beings have something called common sense that we don't know how to build into computers currently. That's what picking up the cup is. It's some basic rules about the way this world works. We're able to, this is when we're children and we'll crawl around, we pick up. What humans don't have that machines have is uh, incredible computational power and access to infinite knowledge. Computers can do that. So if, if you have a Gordon Ryan with the infinite knowledge and compute power, that's just going to, uh, because we know how to do that, that that's going to uh, blow out of the water. Uh, a Has robot there been any to update to on the um, uh, the phenomenon of, of of cyborg or centaur chess? There, there was some debate as to whether or not um, uh, cyborg chess teams could stay competitive with the uh, the latest machine learning. Has there been any update on that? Is yeah, there... I believe at this point machines. Uh, dominate over the, over the, the machine uh, human pairs. With the human pairs, when they first came out, they were good chess players, but not great chess players. Mm. Does it make any difference if you have, say, Gary Kasparov and a, uh, and a, a computer working in unison versus yeah. Joe Blow from... No, it, it does make a huge difference, but yeah, both are destroyed by machines at this Interesting. point. Interesting, and it's not even competitive now? No, it's not competitive. But they also lost interest in this kind of uh, idea. So I think there's still competitions between human machine pairs versus human machine pairs, almost like uh, to, to see how the two work together. But in terms of machine versus human machine pair, machines still dominate. Interesting. So, and, and now we've retrieved back as human beings caring mostly about human versus human competition, yes, which yeah. is probably what the future will look like. It's very interesting to think, but like that that in chess happened really quickly. It won't happen, and it wasn't so painful in chess because we care about chess, but it's not so fundamental to human society. In uh, when you start talking about <laughs> Cyborg Gordon Ryan's, which really beyond grappling is referring to robots operating in physical space or human robot hybrids operating in physical space. You're talking about our society is now full of cyborgs. Yes. And that that might that transition might be very painful or transformative in a way we can't even predict. And that very much has applications as both China and US now have legalized is uh, autonomous weapon systems. So use of these kinds of systems in military applications. So it used to be, there'd been a big call in the AI community to ban autonomous weapons. So the use of artificial intelligence in in war, just like bioweapons are banned uh, internationally. So you're not allowed to use bioweapons in war. And actually most people, even terrorists, have kind of agreed on this ban. It's not like a, there's been a quiet agreement, like we're not going to be doing this because everybody's gonna get really pissed off. With autonomous weapon systems, that's not been the case. What China has said that they're going to be using AI in their military. And uh, the US in 2021 just released a report saying that they're going to, um, they're they're going to add increasing amounts of artificial intelligence into our military systems, into drones, into just everything that's doing any kind of both strategic and actual like bombing and uh, defense systems. I presume uh, a drone army would easily defeat a, a human army in the, in the near future. Like, um, I mean, think about 
just off the top of my head, just think about the implication of kamikaze drones versus a naval fleet. I mean, kamikazes with humans in World War II did terrible damage to our Navy. Imagine swarms of of uh, mechanical kamikazes which have no fear, no remorse. I mean, but it's very uh, inefficient. Kamikaze is very inefficient. You want to be very like war is. It's the same discussion to jujitsu, right? You want to be, uh, you want to create an asymmetry of power, and you want to be efficient as in the way you deliver that power. It actually goes back to the picking up a cup. Currently, a lot of things we do in war, like uh, so most of the drones that you hear about, they're not autonomous. Not most, all. They're usually piloted by. They're piloted yeah. remotely by humans. And humans are really good at this kind of um, what's necessary to deliver the most damage, targeted damage, effective as part of the largest strategy you have about bombing the area or all that kind of stuff. I don't know how difficult that is to automate. I think the biggest concern, I actually have a sense that it's very difficult to automate. The biggest concern is almost like an incompetent application of this and uh, consequences that are not anticipated. So you have a, a drone army where you say, we want to target, you give it power to target a particular terrorist. And then there's some bug in the system that has a like, for example, has a large uncertainty about the location of that terrorist. And so it decides to bomb an entire city. You know, almost like there's a bug, a software bug. Mm. I'm much more concerned about like, bad programming and software engineering that I am about like malevolent AI systems that uh, destroy the world. So the more we rely on automation, this is the lesson of human history, the more we give to AI, to software, to robotic systems, the more we forget how to uh, supervise and oversee some of the edge cases, all the weird ways that things go wrong. And then the more stupid software bugs can lead to huge damage. Like, you know, even like nuclear explosions, those kinds of things. If we add AI into the launch systems for nuclear weapons, for example, I think human history teaches us that software bugs is what will leave, lead to World War III, not malevolent AI or human beings. Interesting. By the way, I deeply appreciate how knowledgeable you are about the history of artificial intelligence. That was awesome. Oh, no, it's, it's fascinating stuff. You know, I, I remember reading when I was a child about, you know, Turing tests and things like this, and visionaries from the 1950s had ideas. But to see it come this far is just fascinating to me. Um, okay, so so what can we as jujitsu players take away from this? We saw that when it comes to computers versus humans, in chess tournaments, humans had something truly valuable to give to the computers. And that was heuristic rules. In every coaching program that I run, I make an endless quest to search out and find effective heuristic rules. That's the basis of a good training program. Heuristic rules and principles give vast informational content which can rapidly increase your performance on the mat just as they rapidly increase the performance of chess computers to overcome their human adversaries. The great human weakness is computational power. Most people vastly overestimate their ability to reason and problem solve under stress. In fact, Numerous psychological studies have shown that humans can balance a relatively small number of uh, of competing options in in, in stressful decision making. But what we do have, what is it, the the great and unique human gift, is this idea to come up and arrive at heuristic rules and principles, which turn out to be very effective guides to behavior for both human behavior and artificially intelligent behavior. Make that your focus in study. Don't try to remember 10,000 different details on a move. Okay, that's, that's human weakness, not human strength. Our strength is heuristics. 
make that your focus, not endless computations over 25 details here merged with 27 details here. That, that's, not a, that's not what humans are good at. The uniquely human strength is arriving at these heuristic rules and principles which guide our behavior, which provide simplifications, which enable us to take vast amounts of information and parry it down to a few simple rules that effectively guide our behavior. Take that core insight from the discussion that Lex and I just had. It was a complex discussion. We both apologize for going a little bit overboard. That was awesome. Then dragging you into some details there, but take that away from I it. I love it. It'll make you better at jujitsu. Sorry, Lex. <laughs> that was uh, that was a really exciting discussion, and uh, the depths of knowledge in the dimensions of knowledge you have and interests you have is just fascinating. 